Okay, hey folks, hope you had a fantastic break. I'm getting started here recording uh, these uh, lectures for chapter nine. Um, so what I want to say uh, right away, I'm having issues with my stylist app. Um, so right now I don't have the ability to write on the notes like I normally do. Kind of frustrating. Um, hashtag 2020 problems. Um, so I'm going to try my best to annotate on these notes using these PDF annotators. Um, but what I'm really going to be doing today are building molecules for you. I've got my son's Play-Doh sets here, um, and I'm going to be building some molecules for you in this chapter. And what I, what I also want to say is um, we're not going to do this complete chapter 9, all right? And we're only going to be doing sections 9.2, 9.3, and 9.4. And so I'm going to cross off um, the learning goals that we're not going to do. Okay, so we're not going to worry about this learning goal number seven. So I'm going to um, put a cross through there. Let's make that red. I'm kind of learning. Oh boy. Using a different app here. Learning as I go. Um, so let's see. So yes, we're not going to do this one. Cross that off. Okay. Um, we're not going to do um, learning goal number eight either. Okay, cross that off. I'm trying to make X's the best that I can. Um, and we're not going to do any of these others, 9, 10, or 11. So I'm going to cross all of these off. Um, however, learning goals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, um, we will go through. Okay? So let's get it going, folks. So let's see. I'm going to get the red color here. Okay, so we're starting here with 9.2. Oh, I wanted that to be red. Okay, great. So, um, Vesper theory, V-S-E-P-R, valence shell, electron pair, repulsion theory. Um, so, this is basically a model that builds upon Lewis structure, okay, and looks at the arrangement of valence electron pairs around a central atom and attempts to, to predict what the shape of this molecule should be, the three-dimensional shape, okay? So there's a couple things we need to discuss with that. We need to talk about the electron pair geometry. So this is the arrangement of uh, bonding pairs as well as lone pairs about a central atom, all right? Um, and so with that electron pair geometry, we have to first start, number one, by... Um, man, this is going to get annoying until I find a new app. Um, so we first start by drawing the Lewis structure, okay? And um, hopefully you should be all good there. And once we draw the Lewis structure, we then have to determine what's called the steric number of the central atom, okay? And so that steric number is the number of atoms bonded to the central atom plus the number of lone pairs on the central atom. I really like to think of the steric number as basically... Uh, the number of things around the central atom. So I'm going to add that as a uh, text box here. Okay. Let's see. Yes. The number of things around the central atom. And as you can see, this is going to be only slightly awkward with my inability to use my stylist. Okay. Steric number. Number of things around the central atom. Where... Um, a lone pair counts as one thing. Okay, so let's go and do some examples. So what is the steric number for the five structures, structures shown? So let's first start with this carbon dioxide. Okay, so there I've got my carbon central atom. Okay, and it might be tempting to say there's one, two, three, four things around it, but remember that is the number of atoms bonded to each central atom. So really this carbon uh, just has a steric number of two, okay? So steric number of two because it's just got two oxygens around it, okay? So let's look at this next one, boron trifluoride, okay? And uh, as you might guess, there's, the boron is the central atom, there's three things surrounding it. 
So that is a steric number of three. And if we keep going through this list, you can see carbon tetrachloride is going to have a steric number of four. Um, phosphorus pentafluoride, one, two, three, four, five, is going to have a steric number of five. Okay. And then uh, this sulfur hexafluoride is going to have a steric number of six. All right, so these ones were all pretty straightforward because there was no um, lone pairs around the central atom. So, but remember, if we did have a lone pair on the central atom, that counts as one of these things, right? It's the number of things bonded. Uh, let's see, it's the number of things bonded, right? Plus the number of lone pairs. Okay, great, moving forward. So I'm gonna go through each of these categories one by one. I'm gonna build up the molecules. I've got toothpicks, I've got Play-Doh. So when we first start here with an electron pair geometry, so there's, there's really gonna be two types of geometry we talk about. There's the electron pair geometry, okay? And then there's the molecular geometry. And in some cases, those two things have the same number. Um, but in other cases, those two things are different. And when we encounter cases where it's different, um, interesting stuff happens, okay? So in this electron pair geometry, when there's two, and when also the molecular geometry is the same, also two, we call this linear, okay? And so now, as you imagine, um, you know, carbon dioxide, here I've got my Plato carbon atom, okay? So I can make a double bond and add an oxygen there. And I can make another double bond. I'll try to hold this up so you can see what I'm doing here. Okay? We call this linear, hopefully it stays together. We call this linear because, well, it's, it's linear, right? There's, as you can see from my picture, 180 degrees is the bond angle between this atom and the next atom. Um, and by the way, the, the colors that I've chosen are uh, universal. So uh, carbon is always uh, given as the black color when using three-dimensional models. Oxygen is always red. And we'll see some of these other colors. You don't have to know these colors, but um, there is a reason why you see the same colors all the time. Okay? So this one's really simple. It's linear. Okay? Easy. So let's move on. Okay? So now, what about if we have an electron pair geometry that's three? And by the way, by saying this electron pair geometry, right, we're really talking about the bonds um, that are in each one of these, uh, or the, excuse me, the electrons that are in each one of these bonds, right? So if I make a central atom with three bonds like this, okay, and I'm not telling you what I put on those, we don't know if it's the electron pair geometry, uh, or we can't really tell if, what the difference is, if this is electron pair or molecular, until I start putting uh, other atoms around it, right? And as I start putting other atoms around it here, now I can tell that that's my molecular geometry. And also, you notice how I put these all at a nice 120 degree angle, um, because, right, three things in a 360 degree circle, three divided by, or 360 divided by three gives me 120, okay? Um, we call this trigonal planar because it's, it's in a plane, as you can see, it doesn't really have um, this like, you know, if I hold it flat like this, you don't really see necessarily like a dimension coming up this way, right? It's just a flat plane. So I want you to know these names, okay? Trigonal planar, for electron pair geometry of three, okay? And so now what we're gonna have, we're actually gonna see from this electron pair geometry, which gives us like our starting point, three things around the central atom. This is actually going to give us two specific molecular geometries, okay? So when it's three atoms, we call it trigonal planar, like I've got written right there, okay? But now look what happens. 
when I have this molecule right here, SO2, and I'm going to make this SO2 by doing the following, I'm going to remove one of those atoms, and I'm just going to replace it with an open stick right here. This open stick, you can think of this as an electron pair, kind of like what's showing you um, in this picture right there, okay? So now this is a great example of where we see the electron pair geometry being three, but the molecular geometry is different when I change the number of atoms, okay? So this is no longer called trigonal planar, and I highlighted the wrong thing. This structure is called bent, because now when I look at it, you know, I can't hold this in a way that you can see. There we go. It just looks bent. You know, keep in mind that this represents an electron pair, and that electron pair wants to, you know, repel the electrons that are in this bond, right? Um, so it has this appearance of having this bent shape, okay, that you can see right there, all right? So trigonal planar, two types of molecular geometries exist. Yeah, I want you to know the names of both. There's the trigonal planar, uh, right, which is given like so. Um, and then there's bent. And bent, again, is when we still have a lone pair right there. Okay, and now actually I need to make for the SO2, right, technically one of those is a double bond, right, but still has that bent trigonal planar shape. Okay, moving on. So now, when we have an electron pair geometry of four, steric number of four, we're actually going to get three specific geometries, okay? And hopefully you can see by now the way this is going to work, the bigger the number gets, the more specific geometries there are, and it's always one less than the total. So for example, if there's steric number of four, there's going to be three specific molecular geometries. When there was a steric number of three, there was two specific geometries. And as you might guess in the coming slides, when there's a steric number of five, there's four molecular geometries. So let's go through these. So the first one I'm going to start with is tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. So really this gives us like, I like to think of this as like maybe the album and then all of these three specific molecular geometries are like songs that are a part of this album. So here we've got the tetrahedral album, and we're going to talk about the hit track on the tetrahedral album, the tetrahedral shape. Okay, And the tetrahedral shape is given by, as you can see, four atoms bonded around the central atom. When we look at this methane and we draw the Lewis structure, we kind of draw it in this way that looks like a plane, right? Like this, which is what we did with trigonal planar. However, Vesper theory says, you know, this is only going to have a 90 degree angle between bond to bond. These electrons want to spread out as much as possible because they repel themselves. So what happens instead of making this planar geometry, it makes what we call a tetrahedron, okay? And a tetrahedron has slightly more than 90 degrees. So if I make this 90 degrees, right? The tetrahedron is technically 109.5 degrees like that, right? Something like that, okay? So there's a 109.5. But now when I rotate this, I've got to make another set, another 109.5, okay? And it kind of almost looks like a pyramid a little bit, right? Where it can rest on my hand, perhaps, if I've built it well, if my hand is big enough to support it. You know what I mean? Okay, great. And now if I put, uh, let's say, hydrogens all around, I've now got a beautiful little molecule of methane, okay, three-dimensional. The Play-Doh doesn't hold up very well, okay? So this makes my lovely tetrahedral geometry. So these things should be sitting up. If you've got like styrofoam and toothpicks, that works really well also, okay? 
And so you can also see, uh, for example, carbon tetrachloride, that's going to make a, tetrahedra, a tetrahedral geometry. Um, and the way we draw that, so when we draw this Lewis structure with all four things, you know, it looks like it's 90 degrees, right? So the way we draw these things for a flat piece of paper is by drawing two lines right there. And those two lines, what they're really supposed to represent are the atoms that are in the plane of, let's say, the piece of paper. That would be this atom and um, this one. Okay, so this atom and this atom are in the same plane, right? But now, let's see, the atom that's in the background, which would be this one, and the atom that's in the foreground, which would be this one, we represent with a dashed line and a wedge. Um, so typically, the, the wedge means it's going out at you, and the dashed line uh, means it's going, you know, in through the paper. Okay, so that's how we can draw that to give us a, um, a three-dimensional shape. And actually, let's see here if I can get this. There we go. That's how I know I've got it as a tetrahedron, right? And I can rotate it around. And oops, you can see my Play-Doh is failing here. And I can rotate it around. And it's supposed to be symmetrical, but I'm doing the best I can here. Okay, so let's see. Moving on. So still within the tetrahedron, tetrahedral family, okay? Um, oops, now, so this one is supposed to be um, trigonal pyramidal, okay? Or a trigonal pyramidal. And so now if I can do that by the following. So if I still stick with my tetrahedral, my tetrahedron, right? And I just remove one of these atoms and replace that with a lone pair, it still has four things around it, right? If you look at this ammonia, it's got three atoms surrounding the nitrogen and one electron lone pair. That's still going to make this tetrahedral geometry, okay? However, the angle is no longer 109.5. The angle is now just slightly um, less and the reason why that angle is slightly less is because this electron pair, it doesn't have a nucleus up here to balance the charge of the electrons that are in this bond. So what it does is this electron pair repels this bond and this bond and this bond. So it kind of makes it so it stands up a little bit more, right? And so now the bonds between atoms, like the bond between this atom and this atom, is now 107 degrees instead of 109.5. I'm not so concerned with you memorizing these numbers as long as you recognize that the tetrahedral, tetrahedral is what I'm going to start calling it, tetrahedral, tetrahedral, is 109.5. Now when I go to tetrahedral trigonal pyramidal, this electron pair repels those atoms down and it makes the bond between them shorter, the angle, and it makes the angle between the electron pair and the atom larger, right? Because it's repelling it away, okay? And so now, so that was our um, second geometry of the tetrahedral family. And then the final one is the bent geometry, okay? And so a great example of this is the water molecule. And so now if I remove one of these, and uh, let's see, I need to start with a fresh atom here. So actually, yes, let's go to the red, red for oxygen. I forgot to use blue for nitrogen on that last example. Okay, so now when you draw the Lewis structure of water, like is given right here, okay, it appears to be linear at first, right? It's just two atoms. And when you draw that Lewis structure, um, you know, you, you draw it evenly, and we've kind of said, yeah, don't worry about it. It's, um, you know, fine. Loose structure doesn't have to represent the geometry. So then why is the water molecule bent like this? Well, it's bent because you can see it's got those two lone pairs. So that still gives it this tetrahedral arrangement of atoms, or arrangement of electron pairs around its central atom, right? 
But now when I put the two hydrogens there, okay, it gives it that bent looking shape, okay, which is pretty cool. So this is the way, you know, you are used to seeing the water molecule drawn like that in that bent shape. What's not included here in this picture is you don't see those electron pairs. And just like what happened in the ammonia example, now because there's two electron pairs, it's pushing these bonds even more. So now the angle between hydrogens and water becomes 104.5, okay? I think I have a summary of that. Yes, I have a nice summary of that right here, okay? So the tetrahedral geometry, um, which is, I would say by far the most common geometry we'll see in chemistry, um, can be given by the following. Look, four, zero, three, one, and two, two. So four atoms with zero lone pairs, three atoms with one lone pair, and two atoms with two lone pairs. That's how we get um, those pairwise options, okay? Um, because otherwise, if it was just one atom and three lone pairs, right? That just looks like this, and we just call that linear, right? That's just like an oxygen-hydrogen linear molecule, okay? Even though technically the electron pairs would still have a tetrahedral arrangement, right? Those three lone pairs around the oxygen, okay? So as you can see now, the bond angle uh, decreases as we have less atoms, okay? Um, so just recognize that, that the, the trend of these bond angles um, goes as is given in this picture, all right? Okay, so I'm going to go through these other geometries um, with a little bit less detail, but certainly um, these first uh, three families that I discussed, let's go back up to the top here, linear, linear and linear, only one specific geometry, trigonal planar, um, has two, it's trigonal planar and bent, both from a steric number of three. And then tetrahedral, steric number of four, gives us three geometries, tetrahedron, trigonal pyramidal, and bent, okay? So let's see here. On my learning goals, did we cover through all of those? Okay, be familiar with Vesper theory, including electron pair geometry and steric number. Yep. Okay, know the electron pair geometries, names, shapes, and angles. The trend of the angles is fine. Two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so we still got to talk about five and six. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so here we go. And so now, because this is getting to be a lot, I'm just going to summarize this all in one slide. So as you might guess, because there's a steric number of five, that gives us four specific geometries, okay? And those come from five atoms and zero lone pairs, four atoms and one lone pair, three atoms and two lone pairs, two atoms and three lone pairs. So I will first start by just making a central atom and I will spread around five electron pairs. And so the first way I can do that is just making them go uh, pole to pole, right at 180 degrees, all right? And then now I've got three more to spread around. And because these things want to spread out as much as possible, this makes an equatorial region, right? That's 120 degrees. So one, two, three, all of those are 120 degrees. And if I rotate that up now, I've got two more that are 180 degrees. So this gives me my trigonal bipyramidal, bipyramidal shape. And the reason why it's called trigonal bipyramidal is because there's your trigonal shape right there. And bipyramidal, because on the top half of this, I can make a pyramid, right? By connecting all these lines. And on the bottom half of this, I can make a pyramid. So trigonal bipyramidal. So when I have all five of these being bonds, let's put atoms around here and hope my Play-Doh and toothpicks can handle five bonds here. 
All right, lovely. So when I've got, oh yeah, they're starting to droop. So when I've got um, five bonds to five atoms, we just call it also trigonal bipyramidal, okay? So now what if I make one of these a, a lone pair, okay? So I'll take that away. Uh, let's see here. I'll take away um, one that would be easiest for me to describe. Yes, I'll take away this. So this is now called the seesaw because literally it looks like a seesaw, right? You could go back and forth tipping it, okay? So that's this one right here. And what this means now is these angles are no longer 90. So actually the way that this naturally wants to droop like that, that's what would happen. These electron pairs would be repelling these things down, okay? So now what happens if I take away another atom, all right? Well, I'm going to take away another atom. Um, I can really do it just about anywhere. And I end up with the same thing, T-shape, right? Because it looks like a T. And remember, I still have these lone pairs. They haven't gone missing, right? I have to have those lone pairs there to still make this, this trigonal bipyramidal shape, all right? Um, and then now finally, if I take away one more, and you really, you would think, well, I could take away this one, or I could take away this one. This is the one that's going to get taken away, because once again, these atoms and electrons want to spread themselves out as much as possible. So now it just kind of looks like you have a linear molecule. However, you would still have these three lone pairs giving you that trigonal bipyramidal shape. Okay, my poor Play-Doh can't handle the five bonds. So now let's go to the final electron pair geometry, octahedral. And one of the first questions I'm used to getting with this is why octahedral if it's six? Okay, so let's make an octahedral atom. All right, so here is my octahedral atom. Look, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six electron pairs, right? There's a plane with four at 90 degrees each, and then there's the two pole-to-pole -pole ones that are 180 degrees. Technically, then, the bond angle for all of these is 90. They're all 90. So why octahedral? Well, if you count the number of planes you can make, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight sides to this shape. That's why it's called octahedral, okay? And so as you might guess, because this is a steric number of six, there becomes five specific geometries, okay? If I have atoms on each, and we'll do this quick so that my Play-Doh can hold up. Oh my gosh. The way that this molecule is just sagging is kind of like the story of 2020, right? Hold on, baby. Don't fall apart. We're almost done. Okay. Octahedral. Beautiful. If I take away one, I still have to leave the electron pair there. All right. If I take away one, I get something that we call square pyramidal. And it's square pyramidal because I have a square plane, um, but it still has like a, a pyramid up top there. If I take away another, now I just have square planar, okay, with the two, so these empty toothpicks would be empty lone pairs, and now square planar. And those are the only ones that I'm going to hold you responsible for. So as it says, although these geometries are impossible, you really hardly ever encounter molecules that have those geometries, okay? Um, so let's take a look at the learning goals, see how we did. So know the electron pair geometries. I want you to know the names, the shapes, and the approximate angles. When the angles are like exactly 180 or 90 or 120, I want you to know that. And I do want you to know the 109.5 angle for tetrahedron. But when these atoms start to like, you know, force the angle down just a little bit, you only need to know qualitatively, is it a little bit less than 109.5 or is it a little bit less than 90? That's, that's kind of what I want you to know. Like how it says that right there. You know what I mean? Less, less than 90, okay? You don't have to know it exactly. 
Um, okay, so I talked about that. So know the specific molecular geometries. So again, that's getting into um, all those specific names, like for example, an octahedral, there's octahedral, square pyramidal, and square planar. So that would be knowing the specific geometries within each family. We can call each of these steric numbers a set of families, if you will. All right. Okay. Um, and then this final thing. So let's see, I've been talking for about 30 minutes. So I'll go over this very last learning goal, which kind of goes nicely with stuff we've already talked about. And that's polar bonds and polar molecules. Okay. So we talked about that with Lewis structure when we were drawing molecules like on a flat piece of paper, right? Um, so now I want you to start thinking about how that could change with this three-dimensional shape. So for example, if I go back to water here, okay, we now know that water is bent and maybe we knew water had this bent shape before, um, but we didn't know why. So hopefully now we know why, okay? Well, this is definitely polar and it's polar because I've got these positively charged hydrogens down on this half of the molecule. And I got these negatively charged electron pairs on this half of the molecule. So you can see here, the picture shows the overall dipole moment, right? We know we can make a dipole moment along each bond, but the overall dipole moment points straight up through to the rest of the molecule. Why is that important? Well, as we shall see, when we get into chapter 10, I'm going to build myself another water molecule real quick. When we start putting these molecules next to each other, so now I've got two waters. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm pretty good. They're going to align with the dipole moment, right? So these water molecules are not going to go together like this with the two positively charged hydro uh, hydrogens touching. It's not going to happen. They're going to repel. However, one of these can flip and rotate and these things will bond together quite well and that bonding we call that an intermolecular bond and that's the type of bond we would see in a liquid or a solid because as a gas right these are all floating around everywhere they're not really interacting with each other however if we cool these molecules down and get them to condense into a liquid they're going to arrange in this way that lines up the dipole moments, okay? Particularly when we freeze it to a solid, they're really going to line up well. As a liquid, they can still kind of tumble around a little bit, okay? But as a solid, they're just going to lock in based on those dipole moments. And as you also might guess, molecules that do not contain a permanent dipole moment. So for example, this molecule right here, this uh, carbon tetrafluoride, each one of those bonds are certainly polar, but because it's symmetrical, there's no net dipole moment. And again, I'm doing a little foreshadowing, but as we shall see in chapter 10, this really makes a big difference to physical properties such as the boiling point or the melting point. Um, so th those types of properties are really manifested by the molecular shape. So shape determines function, okay? So I think that's a pretty good amount of stuff for this lecture. So be able to predict if something is polar based on its molecular geometry. Fantastic. I um, mean, as you can see, this is going to be a fairly short chapter. I'm just going to have one more lecture to go um, doing these last two learning goals. Hopefully I figure out how to use an app that will let my stylist work again. I apologize for the awkwardness. Um, okay, so I will see you all in discussion on Tuesday.